We want all the distractions to leave so that we're, we're just intentionally focused on what God has for us. And what we learned in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, And God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them male and female, and he created them because God blessed them. And, and, and we've learned that the blessing of God is on the family. The blessing of God is on, on, on your life and my life. And he says this. He says, and I said to them, be fruitful and increase. In other words, your life and family should be fruitful. It should increase. Listen, and we learn that, 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 that it should fill the earth and subdue it. And we're to rule over these things that God has entrusted us with. And so it is imperative that, that you understand that as you're going into this 21 days of prayer and fasting, you're not going in there trying to get God's validation. You already got that. You're not trying to go in there to try to get God's acceptance. You already got that. You're not trying to go in there to try to convince God to do something for you. He's more convinced to do something for you than you're trying to convince him to do it. And so at the end of the day, you got to realize that I want to go in knowing that I'm blessed, I'm favored, and this is what God wants for my life. One of the things that, that, that really in some sense has that drove me to, to like, this is the series that you need to do. And, and the series that's coming up called So Will I is based out of Isaiah chapter 61. And, and this is what I believe we're stepping into. And the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach. In other words, to, to share what God's doing in my life. And he says, and, and to share, to, uh, to preach the good tidings to the poor, he has sent me. And so you got you to gotta know that as, as you're going into your work environment, as you're going out into doing your things, that, that, that God is sending you out there. And he's not just sending you out there just to send you. He's sending you out there because you got some good news to tell some people. And, and then and watch what he says. To heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to Comfort all who mourn. And here it is, to consider those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. And this is what the Lord has been dealing with me in this, in that it is the oil of joy for mourning. That, 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 that I really believe that these 21 days is going to begin a journey of joy for us. That, and, and why? It is because the garment of praise that he's putting on you for the spirit of heaviness. And, and, and this is what we're going to do afterwards. Before I release you afterwards and those of you online, we're going to break the spirit of heaviness over people's lives. Because if there's anything that's robbing you of joy, this joy that you should be having is a heaviness that you're putting on every day. That the enemy's putting this heaviness on you and, and you're, you're carrying all these things when your life was never meant to do that. And this is why you got to go in the presence of the Lord every day in these 21 days of fasting. Why? Because I want the oil of joy over my life. I, I, I don't want to live a day, another day without the joy of the Lord because the joy of the Lord is my strength, Right? And look what he says, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planet of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And this is what I believe destiny is stepping into in these latter parts of the month. And this is for your business. This is for your life. This is for your spiritual journey. This is for your family. This is for your marriage. This is for your kids. And it's this, and they, who is they? Not me, it's you. It's you that are watching. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the ruined cities and the desolations of many generations. That God is saying in this fact, what has been broken in the past, I'm going to heal it for your future. That's what I'm going to do. And this is why you want to you, you you, you do this. Think about Paul. Oftentimes you can look at Paul and you can go, man, this guy's, had, this guy's had it hard. Even though he's contributed to three quarters of New Testament theology. Listen, he, it wasn't a cakewalk for him. But Paul is in prison and he's writing to the church at Philippi. And while in prison, I'm not talking about our kind of prison. I'm talking about prison back in those days. And look what he writes to the church at Philippi. He says this, rejoice in the Lord always. How is it that Paul could be in prison and then say, 
to the church at Philippi who has the ability to do what they want to do because they're free to do what they want, and he tells them to rejoice always. And then he reiterates it, and he says, and again, I will say rejoice. Paul is telling you that the joy that you carry is not conditional. It's not based on what you're going through, whether you're having a good day or a bad day. All the joy is, the only condition that the joy is, is that you're walking in the Spirit. That, man, I, I wake up today and my circumstances don't look good, but I got the oil of joy over my life today. Man, Pastor Obed, I just got a negative report, but the oil of joy is over my life today. Man, Pastor, you know what? I, someone dogged me at work, talked about me, stole some things from me. No, but I got the oil of joy over my life. See, get past the immaturity that joy is only pre predicated uh, uh, on the fact that everything has to go good for you. No, I got joy every day. At the end of the day, joy is not a feeling. Joy is in your spirit. And so every day I'm going to wake up, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And he says this because the Lord is near. Now, and it, he's saying, I'm in prison right now. I'm, I'm locked up right now. But I'm telling you, rejoice. I have every reason to look around and not have joy in my life. But God gives me the oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness over my life. And this is why every day I make the choice, pray. Every day I have to decide I'm going to pray. And, and just think if you made this decision right here, here it is, pray first, act second. How many of us act first, and then all of a sudden, we react to our acting, and then we start praying? Imagine if every morning, you decided as a family, hey, what about these next 21 days? Mom and dad, you wake up a little bit earlier than everybody else, and you decide as a family, we're going to pray first and act second. That, that, that my actions are, are, are really a result of the fact that I'm praying every day. Because if your actions are what you're doing, but you decide to pray first every day, it doesn't matter where your actions take you. I got the joy of the Lord is my strength. I got the oil of joy over my life. I want to I give you a couple of things that I really believe prayer does. And I want to, if there's anything today, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be as, as, as transparent as I ever have. Because... If there's one thing I love to do, but, but it's also the same thing that I don't always feel like doing, is prayer. And the first thing you got to realize about prayer is that, number one, prayer replaces worry. Prayer replaces worry. Paul is writing about, I'm going to continue in Philippians chapter 4. And look what Paul says this in Philippians 4. He says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, here it is, let your request be known to God. You know what we always say? Well, God knows what I'm going through. He does. But he wants you to know what you're going through. He wants you to tell him what you're going through. One of the things I love about the Bible is I love words. One of, the, one of my best classes I took in Bible college was linguistics. I love, I, I, I love words. And that word, the word worry, listen to me, the word worry comes from a root word which means to choke or to strangle. Think about this. The word worry means to, to kind of choke or to strangle. In other words, worry robs you of your future. Most of the things you worry about is never about what's happening now. It's about what's happening in your future. And the thing is, is that every time you worry, you are putting a choke on the future that God has for you. Can I go a little deeper? This is why Jesus one day knew that we would have a condition in our lives and want to be tempted to worry. 
This is why one day he stood up and told the disciples, don't worry about tomorrow. But let tomorrow take care of itself. For tomorrow is in my, it's in my, come on, it's inside of my. And so here's what you do. When you worry about your future, that God says don't worry about it because it's in my hands. You are literally taking the hand of God and strangling it. And saying, God, I'm going to put a choke over what you have in your hand because I'm going to worry about what's, what, what's, what's consuming my thoughts right now. And God says, don't worry about that. Matter of fact, Jeremiah goes even further. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, he says this. He says, your hope that I've given you, your future that I've given you is filled with hope. Listen to me. The future I've given you, it is filled with hope. You want to know what that word field means? That word field means there is not any space left. What God is saying about your future is that it is so in my hands that there is no space left to add anything that the world is trying to place on your life. So you're not walking into an empty future. You're walking into a future where there's no space left that literally... You can, and the only time you bring things into your future is when you worry about it. And God's saying, why are you trying to remove what, what I've already filled? I've already filled that space. And everything about the space in your future has everything to do with the fact that it's filled with hope. And so you're waking up every day and you're worried about what's going to happen next week. How are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to do it? And God says, what are you worried about that for? Why are you worried about that? You are strangling and choking what I already have in my hand. Can I tell you what worry is or, or, or what, what worry actually reveals? And it's this. Listen, what, worry, what we worry about most reveals where we trust God least. I, I'm... I'm, I'm some of you are so worried about your finances, why don't you start trusting him? Some of you are so worried about your family, why don't you start committing them to him? Some of you are so worried, oh my God, about my body. Man, I'm, Pastor, I'm just going through all kinds of changes in my body. Romans chapter 12 says, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto him. Why don't you present your body to him? See, you're worried about things you shouldn't be worried about, especially when your future is filled with, with hope. The second thing is, number two, that prayer relinquishes control. Prayer relinquishes control. Paul continues in Philippians chapter 4. Look what he says. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Just, just think about that for a moment. It guards not only your heart... But it guards what? Come on, it guards what? Guards your minds. It relinquishes control. One of, one of the things, that in, 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 and I'm going to go, I, I, you know, I'm so inspirational. I, I want you to leave so inspired. But I'm, I'm going to be about a 40-second, like, let me just give you a little hard stuff, okay? And, and, and it's this. Some of you spend so much time on social media that it's actually shaping your mind and your heart. And, and, and I would probably say a lot of you in this fast need a fast social media. Because I'm going to tell you what social media does. It gives you a false illusion of reality. I've never seen any, and I, know, I don't know everybody, but I know some, of, some people that go to Destiny, and I see their posts, and I'm like, they're lying. That's a lie. That's a lie right there. They're miserable, they have no purpose, they're searching, but they don't ever put that on there because they want you to perceive something about them that they're still searching for. And so, when, and so, so, so what I like to say is that people who post things often about what they're not are starving to be liked. That's why they like likes, 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 likes. Wow, I'm liked. It's a lack of affirmation. It's a lack of going into prayer. 
I don't want to be liked. I want to be loved by the Father. And at the end of the day, it controls your thoughts. You're on it all day. And sometimes when you have a little bit of time, you run to your phone. I got to see what's happening. I gotta, and you're more in everybody else's business. And I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you that, that if you're not careful, it will rob you from the plan that God has for you. It will rob you from the identity. And you're not confused because of life. You're confused watching everybody else. And at the end of the day, I'm, 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 that's what I'm doing. I'm not only just fasting what, I, what God told me to fast, but I'm fasting social media. And, and not because I, I love it, but at the end of the day, no, God, these 21 days, I want to be so in tune with you. I want to know that what you have for my life, what do you have for my kids, what do you have for my wife? I don't really, and I'm going to be honest, I don't really care what you have for everybody else. What do you have for the Martinez family right now? What do you have for Destiny Church? I don't care what's going on. There. Hey, for these 21 days, God, I'm going to be a little bit selfish about me. And some of you, listen, you're going on, you're looking at stuff, and it's, it's, it's jacking with your head. It's jacking up with your mind. Well, why don't we don't have it like that? Well, look at them. Yeah, what good they got? And you wouldn't be worried about half the stuff. Come on, I know, it's quiet. You wouldn't be dealing with half the stuff. It's a great tool to use when you use it for the right reasons. But some of you can't go a day without taking a picture of yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm being real. There's something missing in your life when that's addicting. It's missing. And you need to make it up at home or make it up in prayer. If you have to tell your wife ten times a day she's the best thing, that she ain't going to look for likes. Come on, I know I'm going to go there. Because, because, because prayer should change us. And I'm passionate about this. Because you don't think I struggle with it? Of course I do. You don't think I struggle with the fact that I want to be liked? Of course I do. But I make sure that I never go on this stage without an amen in my spirit. I make sure that I don't leave my house without saying, God, whether it's five minutes or an hour, whatever it is, I'm going to talk to you first before I, I post anything, before I say anything. And, and matter of fact, I give my wife a hug, and I tell her good morning, and she brings me a cup of coffee, and I don't even have a conversation with her until I've already had a conversation with Jesus. Because I'm worthless doing that. Don't talk to me right now. Shut the door. I don't tell her that, but I always tell her, shut the door. Shut the door. She knows. I'm worthless to her and my family in the church if I'm not talking to him first and then talk to her. That, 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 why? Because at the end of the day, he says, Obed, what I have for you, nobody has. What I have for your church, nobody has. What I have for your life, nobody has. And if you're not careful, you will copy other things from other people. Been there, done that. Come on, why do you like some of the things you like that you didn't like before? Romans 15. Now may God, the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy. This is what he wants to do these 21 days. He wants to so fill you with uncontainable joy in your life. And perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with the superabundance until you radiate with what? Come on, somebody. Hope. Hope. That's it. That there's joy in your life. Num number three, this is what prayer does. Number three, prayer regulates thinking. It regulates thinking. Philippians chapter four says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, and I want you to circle this, whatever is pure. What is pure? Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything excellent is praiseworthy, look what he says. Paul says this. Think about such things. Could you imagine being in prison and going, wow, whatever is true, well, whatever is noble, well, I didn't commit any crime to be in here. And so all he had to do was think about what was pure. That's where your joy comes from. Not your conditions, because those are temporary. 
not a trial. Those usually only last two weeks. Not a storm. Those usually last about two days. So there's no point in getting bent out of shape. The goal is, is I pray first, act second. I commit my life to something bigger than myself. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says this, think about the things in heaven and not the things on earth. Think about the things that, that really last. C.S. Lewis says something like this. He says, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. You'll get neither. Like, like direct all your prayers towards heaven. God, what, what do you have for my family? What do you have for our children? What, what, what do you have for my future? What do you have? You watch God do something supernatural to your life. If you'll just commit to saying, I'm going to pray first and act second. That literally, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend time with you. And then lastly, as I close, num- num- number four, listen, prayer reveals contentment. And somebody who's extremely goal oriented as myself has learned one thing and that is don't ever allow your ambition to get ahead of your purpose because some of you have big dreams and you have great ambition and you're waking up every morning and you're going after it but if you're not careful you can get ahead of what God has prepared you for. And when you step into something that you're not prepared for, in its fullness, it lands up hurting you. Paul continues to write in Philippians 4. He says this, he says, I know what it, it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. He knows it. He says this, this is from prison that he's talking. He says, I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Sometimes people come to me and they'll say, Pastor, I'm going through this. And I know what they're looking for. They're, They're looking for sympathy. They're looking for for an expression of what a a pastor or a father can do. And oftentimes, after I give it, I'll tell them this. Embrace this place. And they'll sometimes look at me cross-eyed and like, but pastor, I'm I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills this month. I said, embrace this place. Why? Because you won't be there again. But if you don't take in where you're at, when God takes you to where he has for you, you're going to be missing one thing called gratitude. And you don't realize that often the things that happen in your life is never for you, but it's for others. And unless you have, unless you can embrace that place where you don't have nothing, you'll never be grateful when you have everything. This is why David, he writes. This is David. He's king over Israel. He is the shepherd of all shepherds. He has everything you could imagine. And he writes in Psalms 23, he says this, the Lord is my shepherd. That in some sense, even though I am responsible for a nation, I'm still his. I still go to him. See, at the end of the day, I will not, watch this, I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. I'm not chasing after stuff. I'm not trying to chase after things. I'm going after him. 
And these next 21 days, if your greatest need is him, he'll supply the other needs that you need. But don't let something that you need be greater than the need of having him. I need thee today, God. I need you today more than anything. Because the last and final thing is this, and that number five is that prayer relies on God. It puts all your reliance on him. And Paul, <laughs> oh, just study this chapter, man. I, I, I don't know. I might stay in this chapter the whole 21 days because it's doing something to me that while he's in prison, here's what he writes. He says this, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In prison, I can. Philippians 4.19, he says this, even while I'm in prison, my God will supply liberally. In other words, he says, I'm going to fill you until you're full. In other words, there's not going to be an empty space that I talked about your future. He says this, your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. When Paul was taken off the field, he was placed in prison. And what Paul did in prison was write more letters to churches that are impacting more people than he could have ever imagined. And sometimes you think your prison doesn't have a purpose, but it does. And some of you need to lock yourself up in these 21 days and willfully turn yourself in and say, you know what, God? This is what I want for the next 21 days. I want to be focused on you. Because here's what you've been trying to do. God, I need you to move in my family. God, I need you to move in my children. God, I need you to move in my business. And let me help you what, what prayer does. I love what Pastor Chris says. He says this, prayer doesn't move God toward us. Prayer moves us toward God. God hasn't stopped moving. He just doesn't stop at those who have stopped moving towards him. My prayer for you, it's been my prayer this whole week. I told my wife this morning, I can't wait to get to church. I'm, I'm absolutely excited to get to church. Because, because what does this mean? Every day, you're going to get something sent to you. You can go on our website. They just informed me before I went. It's all on our website. It's right there. You can get the whole 21 days. You could print it out or you could just get it sent every day. You can figure out what fast you want to do. But here's, I'm going to tell you what, what the Spirit of the Lord told me. He says, son, destiny is moving into a miracle season. Listen to me, church. I don't say this to get an applause. I'm telling you what I've heard. And he's, this is the exact words he said to me. He says, the blessing is on the other side of their obedience. If they will obey me, I will move them to the place I've already filled called your future. What are you saying? Pray fast. I'm going to challenge you. I know we, we love our Saturdays. Some of you are in football. I, I, I know we do. I love my Saturdays. Matter of fact, next week starts college football. I'm excited about it, okay? But, but I've already got my whole schedule. Like, I already know what I'm doing. But Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock, we meet here. It's called our prayer service. You know what that is? It's moving yourself towards it. Getting your kids and saying, we're going to prayer service today. I'll tell you what it is. It's three songs, great worship. Pastor comes up and exhorts. They put up prayer things on, 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 on the screen. And there's communion. You can come up and take it. You're going to be done in an hour and go, it didn't even feel like an hour. And we end right back in worship. You're going to walk out and your Saturday is never going to be the same. 
Because if you start your weekend with prayer, you'll end it with praise. I'm going to tell you my heart. Can, can I reveal my heart to you? And I'll tell you what my heart is. A church can only be two things. And we saw it in the demonstration of Jesus that angered him so much that he walked into the temple and he turned the tables over. He says the church will either be a den of thieves, which means they come and they rob from me. I give them everything and they're not grateful. Or he says there'll be a house of prayer. And my, my passion is you will catch what's on my heart. I don't care about anything else. But if we can be as passionate in prayer as we are about the air that I breathe every day, I promise you, you will have victory like never before. You will have a life of fulfillment that you've never dreamed. You have doors that will open that only God can open. You have a family that's healthy, that has broken every curse over your family. You will have a, you will have a, a marriage that you never imagined you could ever have. It's all about prayer. I wonder sometimes, God, why do you do the things you do for my life? Why have you blessed me so supernaturally? He goes this, because I can trust you. And I remember this while I was in Scottsdale. I told this to Lisette. I got up early in the morning. I went down, grabbed some coffee out of my devotions. I said, Lord, what do you mean you can trust me? He says, son, listen to me. I trust those who I have a daily conversation with. And then he reminded me this, listen to me. Obed, who do you trust the most besides me? I said, my wife. He says, why? I said, because I talk to her the most. Can I tell you? He just wants to have a conversation with you every day. That's it. And the dreams that you have. He's given them to you. But he doesn't want to give you something and then you stop talking to him. Friends, that's not a marriage. That's a one-night stand. Today, can we be a church that says on Saturdays we're going to commit. We're going to commit. All I'm asking you is three weekends. That's it. I wouldn't ask you to do anything else three weekends, give them a chance and watch what God does to your life when you commit to prayer and fasting. Father, we thank you today. You're so good. You're so awesome. We thank you. Our future has no space left. It's already filled. So we don't need to worry and strangle what's already in your hands. I pray today that you would give every person a conviction of prayer. That the spirit of prayer will be over this house like never before. That we will be a house of prayer and never a den of thieves. Can we pray this prayer? Say, dear Jesus, forgive me for not having the prayer life I was called to do. Today, as we commit this fast to you, my body, my mind, my soul, and my spirit, and my time, I ask you, to reveal to me in these 21 days of things you have for my life, my family, my future. Lord, today, create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I will never be the same 
from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say amen. Amen. Come on, can you clap? Come on, you ought to clap like you know. Come on. I...